they, an outline's being handed out. I, I, as I say every time I give a talk, I, you're not here for me, I'm here for you. And so if you want to take me off topic, I like that. I really like that. And if you disagree with me, that's just fine. Take me on and, and force me, hold my feet to the fire and force me to uh, try and convince you as to what I'm going to tell you. I'm, I'm a weird guy in that I, I really like management. I really like management. I've been doing it since 1978. And I've tried it in all kinds of stuff, single family, multifamily, small commercial. Uh, my expertise is single family. And she had it written down so you already know why. I think the single family house is the only piece of real estate that comes complete with an on-site resident manager who's called tenant. I find that all the other types of, of property management cost more overhead. You gotta supply services. In my neck of the woods, I gotta plow driveways in the winter. I gotta take care of yards in the summer. People in a single family house, if you screen for the right guy and share expectations, you can have someone take care of both the inside and the outside of the house. Now that means you gotta deal with people who aren't quote unquote camping out in your properties. You gotta find people who wanna take your houses and make them their homes. And I think that's really crucial. Um, now, she asked a question a little while ago as to, uh, Christina did, as to how many people don't have a lot of money and wanna get into the business. I really think that master leasing, which is where I start out, is the best way to generate cash flow right up front when you don't have any capital. It's what we tell our kids to do. So let me start there, but, but really jump in, take me off topic, and, and we'll go someplace else if you want to. So let me first of all describe what a master lease is. So as far as I'm concerned, it's the same thing as a sandwich lease. You lease a pro I lease a property from Clyde, and I turn around and sublease it to Ioana, and I take a piece out of the middle, take some profit out of the middle. Does that make sense? So how, how are the different ways I could do that? I could guarantee Clyde so much money a month, whether it's vacant or full, maybe guarantee to take care of all the expenses up to some kind of a stop loss, and, and then I sublease it to Ioana and, and lease it to her for a bunch more and thereby make a profit. Or in a safer way to do it when you're starting out is I could lease it from Clyde on a performance basis, saying, Clyde, I'll pay you a percentage of what I earn if and when I earn it. If I don't earn anything, I won't pay anything. Uh, and so, you know, it really doesn't cost me anything to lease his properties. Do you, do you follow that? Does that make sense? Now, that sounds a little bit like I'm managing his properties, doesn't it? But I'm not. What's the major difference? If I were hired as an, as an agent to manage uh, Clyde's properties, I would be, have a fiduciary responsibility to Clyde to essentially take off my glasses, put on Clyde's glasses, and try and maximize Clyde's bottom line. That's not what I'm doing. I'm a professional tenant. And, and so the only reason Clyde will lease his properties to me is because I'm offering something to him that's a benefit to him so he wants to do business with me. And likewise, the only reason I will lease Clyde's properties from him is that there's some benefit in, to, in it to, for me. If you go to a management company and you're looking at having a manage your properties, what's the very first question you typically ask them? How much? How much, right? So if, if someone called me up and asked me, what's it going to cost? What's your charge? I'd say, gee, that depends. Sometimes there is no charge. Sometimes we guarantee the rent whether it's vacant or full. We need to get together so you can find out a little bit more what it is I think I do, and I need to find out a little bit more about your situation. So what am I saying by that? What I'm saying is infinite flexibility. If you master lease someone's property, since you have to meet their needs, you've got to first find out what their needs are. And if you can't get, meet their needs, if you can't give them what they need, you're not going to do business. But because you can tailor a contract to exactly meet their needs, you can see what they don't need. And everything they don't need, you can take. And there lies a tremendous value in the value of your lease. 
Let, let's go through this just a little bit more, and I'll give you some examples. Um, the, I've got, you know, net cash flow, net positive cash flow after lifestyle cost is really what sets us all free. And leasing property with the right to sublease is a great way to generate that cash flow with a no one size fits all. Here are some real people. You can look them up. They're available. Is anyone in the room uh, connected or, or uh, subscribed to the website uh, cashflowdepot.com or have they heard of it? A couple have. Well, the first group, John Kane and Lauren Brand, have a wonderful video on there that they did in Panama on master leasing. I really recommend those of you who are on it use it. Cashflow Depot is a website that Chris Miller and Jackie Lang created really to keep some of Jack Miller's material, Jack Miller is no longer with us, uh, available. And I, I really recommend it. It's a wonderful website. It's a subscription website, not very expensive, but you can, you, there's a lot of wonderful information on there. Uh, these folks actually came to a seminar I did years ago, but they came out to Colorado with a pop-up camper and they ended up in uh, Lake Dillon area. And if you listen to them or watch them on Cashflow Depot, and this was a number of years ago, maybe five years ago, they went from that pop-up camper and they started leasing properties and subleasing it. And, and they, they said that at that time they were making a positive cash flow of $20,000 a month. Now in California, you might not be able to live on that, but in Colorado, <laughs> Colorado, I can tell you, you can live on that just fine, just fine. They had plenty of time to do everything they wanted to do and it worked out great. Uh, Matt Funk is a friend of mine. He actually had a printing company in Tampa, Florida. He printed my manual for a couple of years. We, did, we do one or two seminars a year. And Matt printed my manual, and the second year he came to my seminar, he immediately sold his printing company. His wife sold audiovisual equipment like this. Uh, she kept selling the equipment, but he stayed home raising two young kids around his swimming pool and doing master leasing, replaced his income very quickly, and has replaced half of his wife's income so far. So he's, he's doing great. Jan Leisure, you, you wonder, does this work everywhere? Jan Leisure lives in Monterey, California. She has Monterey Bay Property Management. And she, um, she started leasing properties. She, she leased them two different ways. She, um, well, let me tell you how she got to Monterey and what happened, because that's very interesting, I think. She uh, transferred to Monterey. Her husband was in the military, and they send people there to take them to the language school. So she got there, and she was um, uh, a PE teacher in the high school. And for whatever reason, the marriage failed, and she ended up there, and she had a house. And one summer, she wanted to go to Hawaii. So she went to Hawaii, and she leased her house out in, in Monterey while she was in Hawaii and discovered that she could pay for her whole trip for Hawaii and still end up making money in the process. So she went back, and she started leasing properties and subleasing them as vacation rentals. And she also took on long-term uh, management. Very successful gal, working very, very well, started with no money at all and, and has a gangbusters business. Uh, Monterey Pro Bay Property Management, you can look her up on the web. Dwayne Talley, he's a, a real estate agent in Bonita Beach, uh, Florida. In Florida, southern Florida, uh, southwest Florida, most of the condo complexes will not allow short-term uh, rentals. And he was a sales guy that controlled the sales in this one condo complex where they did, in fact, allow short-term sales, and most people bought the condos for retirement down the road. And so when they weren't using them, they'd, they'd just soon have them rented. He told them the way they got in the rental pool was th through master leasing them to him, and Dwayne told me that between Christmas and Easter one year, he made $140,000 just subleasing his vacation rentals. I've never done that. I've never done that. I, I also neglected to tell you that Jan Leisure uh, during a time when high-priced properties, she was involved with some properties in Pebble Beach, uh, they wouldn't sell. You know, multi-million dollar properties, it just was the wrong market at the time. So she went to the owners on those properties and said, tell you what, why don't you lease me the properties on a month-to-month -month basis while you're selling them? And, and if you get a contract 
for someone to buy them, all you gotta do is give me 60 days notice and I'll cancel my lease. Cause it takes 60 days to close on the high priced properties. So she moved in and, and put furniture in the property, subleased them as vacation rentals and made $84,000 in six months on nine properties. I haven't done that either. Um, my son-in-law, Kurt Elmas. Kurt is, well, he was a sports writer. He knows everything you ever want to know about sports. He teaches his three kids pretty much every sport known to man. And, and he really lives and dies sports. Well, he, he, was, he was moved around with several different newspapers and found himself in Pocatello, Idaho. We brought him back before we went back to Florida in the fall one to Colorado Springs to see him and the kids. And I'm taking him back to the airport at six o'clock in the morning. And Kurt says, well, you know, we'd really like to get another rental in Colorado Springs. And they had one because they'd lived in Colorado Springs, bought a house, and then when they were moved out of Colorado Springs, they kept the house and rented it out. So I said, gee, I, I think Colorado Springs is a great place to have a rental. And he said, well, you know, actually we've been talking and we think we'd like to move back to Colorado Springs. And I moved to Colorado Springs in 1975 and I raised my family there. And I said, gee, Colorado Springs is a pretty good place to raise a family, what would you do? And then my daughter chirped in at this point and said, dad, you don't have any idea, but we've been up all night talking and we'd like a hostile takeover of your company. <laughs> So, you know, I'm, I'm the guy that says, I don't like partnerships. I think partnerships are real easy to start and real hard to end. And, and the only partnership I really want is my marriage. And we've been married 46 years, so I think maybe it's gonna probably work. But, <laughs> but um, so we set up a, an LLC for Kurt and, and he started master leasing properties and he no longer tells me what he's got. He's, he's very private, but I do know that he certainly had over 90 houses he was master leasing at one point in time. And by doing that, uh, he was able to support my daughter, three kids, a dog, and have a nice motor home and have a very nice lifestyle. So you really can develop a nice lifestyle. At our high watermark, we master leased over 100 houses. We, um, for a good part of that time, I had no employees whatsoever. The, the most employees I ever had was one. And, and I find one person can run 100 houses very, very simply. Um, so what are some of the benefits? See, I think the real, the real issue with a real estate business is people think, I gotta own something, I gotta own all this stuff. Whereas I really think the real question you gotta ask yourself is, why are you doing what you're doing? Why, what benefits do you want? How many of you have heard the name Simon Sinek? Well, you ought to go on YouTube, for those of you who haven't, and look up Simon Sinek, and it's S-I-N-E-K. He did a bunch of TED Talks. And Simon Sinek, um, I think he's very wise. He says, you know, pretty much everyone can tell you what they do. Some people can tell you how they do what they do. But very, very few people can tell you why they do what they do. And, and I think, you know, Christina was asking questions before as to, you know, what's important to you? How are you gonna get there? What are you doing today? Why do you do what you do? Big, big, big question. So when you look at the real estate business, I think you wanna look at the benefits that the real estate will give you. And so let's look at some of the benefits that you can get from master leasing real estate that doesn't require ownership of the real estate. And, and just think for a second, Rockefeller said, own nothing, control everything. And I think there's some real good reasons to control without ownership these days, especially as we see states have more and more laws which are more and more pro-tenant and anti-landlord. I want to be the tenant. And if you master lease, you are a tenant. So let's look at a few of these. First of all, if you master lease a property, you certainly can generate income, right? Because I lease from, from Clyde, sublease to Yuana, take a spread out of the middle, I get income from day one. In, in different parts of, of the country, you're going to need different number of houses to meet your goal as to what the income is. When I started out, I started out in 1978. In 1981, I started managing other people's property because I was managing my own because I couldn't find anyone else that had the attention to detail and follow through to do it right. So I failed into this business, essentially. And, and um, I took on other properties as a fee manager to, to reduce my overhead. On October 1st of 1996, I canceled every agency relationship I had 
and I turned around and leased the properties I used to manage and did not lose one account. Prior to that, in 1984, I leased a house from a real estate broker for 35 years at a fixed rent. And I secured my lease with a deed of trust that said if he failed to pay the underlying encumbrances or taxes and insurance, I could foreclose him. Now that's pretty powerful and there's pretty good benefits there. And 10 years after we started that lease, I was given half the appreciation to remove my lease from the property. So we sold it to a tenant I found that we forced to buy the property. <laughs> so, so I could get the appreciation on that, right? Now what's really interesting is this particular individual was not walking wounded. And, and you could say, well, why the heck would he have done that with, to, with me? He was 59 years old when we made that deal. And we were friends. And in fact, he told me, you get all the appreciation from the time you put your lease on the property. And I said, there's plenty of appreciation. Let's just split it. And we did three other big transactions after that. So don't pre, have preconceived ideas as to what people will do. Why would he lease that to me at that time? I'll tell you. He made most of his money in the paper business. So income came in in dribs and drabs, came in as principal and interest. And he was eating his principal over time as it came in. He had very little tax benefits. Portfolio income, you can't shelter it. And, and so I made him two offers while we were having lunch one day. I said, you know, he said, I've got this property that I want you to, want you to take on the joys of management. And I said, tell me about the property. And he told me, and I said, wrong property. Get me another property. He said, you don't understand. I took this back in foreclosure and I don't want to be involved with it. I want you to have the joy of, of dealing with it. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll give you two offers. The first one is um, I'll lease option it for a period of 10 years. Or the second one is I'll master lease it for 35 years. Now let's look at which is better for, for both of us. Let's see what works. And, and this individual, I said, well, you know, if, if, uh, if, you can't, if, if your income is principal and interest and you're using it up, maybe there's a benefit for you of remaining in title on some real estate because there may be some benefits from that. Depreciation, there may be something you can use. And, and you can't spend it if, if it's there. And maybe it'll be worth $5 million 35 years from now, who knows? Uh, but the real reason that it made sense for him is he had two, he had three adult sons and he was convinced that the moment he dropped dead, they would all buy something red that drove very fast. <laughs> and he loved the fact that he could control from the grave and that they just got a fixed <laughs> monthly income coming in each month. That's really the reason he did it. That was the key reason. And, and he knew me, he trusted me, and he knew that, that we would, I would not take undue advantage of him and we would do other transactions. What other transactions did we do? He sold me a house that, that um, he owned, carried all the financing at 0% interest, loaned me the money in the second position on another house, gave me that house free and clear, and then we renegotiated the payments based on a, an annual payment in advance and got a further discount. Pretty interesting. And this guy had plenty of money, but the difference is as an ender, you know, you've got starters who are just getting started, then you've got estate builders that are building estates. I'm an ender, I'll be 69 years old this, this year. As an ender, you're not concerned as much about return on your investment, you're more concerned about return of your investment. And he knew me, he knew I would do what I said I'd do. Don't ever not, your integrity is the most important thing in this business. So just, just that's a key thing. Uh, so certainly I can get the in income from it. Now I'm down to tax benefits. Let's talk about tax benefits for a second. If you own real estate, you can write it off, right? Right? Yeah. Over what period of time? 27 and a half years or 40 years. You can write the whole thing off, right? Yes. How about the land? You can't write off the land, right? No. Right, you can't. And how about when you sell it down the road? Don't you have to recapture that depreciation? You do. And, and isn't depreciation an alternative minimum tax preference item? It is, it is. 
So if you don't own the property, you're leasing the property, every dime you pay, every dime you pay as rent is a write-off, every one. It's, a, it's an expense. Schedule E, one of your itemized expenses, rent. You're paying rent to, to tie up that property. Do you follow me? So you got a real big deduct there. Okay, what are some of the other things that happens? If, if, does anyone in here manage properties for other people? Your property management company or your your licensed and, and man HOAs. HOAs. Okay. Well, if if you manage properties for other folks, what type of income is that when the income comes in? Regular. Right. Earned income, right? Ordinary income. If instead of managing property for people, you lease the property instead, what kind of income is that? Passive income, exactly right. So you have $100,000 of property management income compared to $100,000 of master leasing income. What's the difference in tax? Is there one? And that, well, what is it? 20%. $100,000, I'm talking federal tax now. Federal tax, $100,000 of property management income is taxed at about $31,000 and change. The same $100,000 for master leasing uh, uh, income is, is going to be $19,000 and change. Why the difference? Why the difference? Exactly right. Passive income is not subject to self-employment tax. So that's 15%. So if management companies would just change the title on their management agreements to lease instead of a management agreement, did nothing else whatsoever, their income would, their net income would go up dramatically. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Now, how about from an owner's standpoint? Is there a benefit of an owner having his property leased instead of managed? You know, if they're, ma if they're managing it for you, their fiduciary responsibility is to meet your needs. They're supposed to take care of you, right? If they're leasing it from you, they're in it for them, not for you. They're in it for them. But at least you are negotiating what benefits, who gets what. And, and in capitalism, each capitalist has to give more than he gets to have a transaction take place, right? I mean, that's, that's the nature of the business. So, so one of the main benefits to an owner, I, I would dare say that under the laws of vicarious liability, if I'm managing a property for any one of you, and I stub my toe, I do something wrong, and the biggest thing I can suggest is, I have a fair housing complaint uh, against me. Someone says I, I illegally discriminated against some protected class, and they come after me, right? Under the laws of vicarious liability, if I'm under an employment contract with you working as your agent, that flows right through to you as a principal, right through to you. And the largest case I've ever heard of was an on-site resident manager in the Washington, D.C. area failed to rent to a family with kids, and which is a protected class under familial status, and the owner was found guilty to the tune of $2.3 million. Now, that would be an excedrin headache. And I suspect, <laughs> I suspect that if there are some of you that are having your properties managed by fee managers, you had no idea that that was a potential problem. Whereas if instead of having it managed by a fee manager, you leased it to someone and they subleased it to someone else and they did something wrong, you're not involved with the occupant at all. Isn't that interesting? Even your wife. Master tenant is liable, but you, the owner of the property, you're protected because he's not working for you. He or she is not working for you, okay? Let's look at a couple more of these. Uh, profit, uh, I pointed, well, I'll give you another idea on, on, uh, on profit. Uh, I did have an office man, question, comment. Yeah. Can we go back to the write-offs? Yeah, sure. You mentioned you can write everything off. Sure. If you have a full-time job, you're limited to 25000 a year. Does it, does Matt yeah. help with that at all? Well, yeah, I think it does. He's pointing out that, um, you know, if you have losses from real estate, you can claim up to $25,000 of losses, but it phases out based on your income level between $100,000 and $150,000. But on a master lease, when you're on a performance master lease, you're only paying money out if you're netting more money in. 
You don't have a loss, right? There is no loss. Yeah, well, if, if, you're, if you're leasing a property and, and I agree to only, if, if I generate $1,000 in, these are totally made up numbers just to give you an example. If, if I get $1,000 of rent in and my agreement says I'm going to give you 80% of what I collect if and when I collect it, I'm only going to pay you $800 if I get 1000 in, right? So how am I going to have a net loss? I'm not. I'm going to have $200 of income. And that's after I've expensed my, my lease payments to you. So the $25,000 loss really doesn't come into play on master leasing unless you have a fixed master lease that I guarantee the rent, whether it's vacant or full, and I, mis, I, I misjudge the market and I take a loss, right? That would be the only way. Where you have a big loss in, in uh, ownership is because if, if you think of it, if you buy a house, most people when they first start out, first of all, they buy what they can afford to buy, which is primarily junk. You know, they, ha they, they want to have some stuff, they want to pay it off, then they want to exchange into better stuff. But, but the key thing is that you just want to be able to figure out how you can have your tenants pay for your house and, and get it free and clear at some point in time, right? Well, if they can pay the principal interest taxes and insurance, the PITI, that how much money does the owner net on the, on the cash flow initially? Nothing. Why? Because operating expenses generally are about 30% of your income. Then you add your debt service to that on top of that. There is a couple of chairs up here if people want to come up. Uh, and, and so for a long time, there's not any real income coming in. There's just losses and then you add the depreciation to it. That's where the $25,000 net loss that you're talking about comes from. On master leasing, I think you have income from day one because you're, you're only paying if you think that you're going to earn more than you pay out. Okay? The big ticket items are the owner's expense. The roof goes bad, call the landlord, call the owner. That's not your expense unless you've agreed it to be your expense which is unlikely, you're going to have a stop loss as to what you're willing to pay. The air conditioner goes out, who's going to fix it? Call the landlord, call the owner, you're, you're a tenant. So there's some major benefits as to what you can, can uh, your, what you can limit in terms of your potential losses. It, it, just going on, one more thing on that, you know, there are a lot of people who bought properties from let's say 2004 to 2008 that maybe wished they didn't buy properties then because they got hurt. I mean, anyone ever heard of anyone that got hurt buying properties <laughs> near the top of the market? Some of them aren't in the business anymore. They're gone. Well, if you lease the properties instead of buying the properties back then, do you think it's easier to get out of title or easier to get out of a lease? Especially if you draft the lease. And, and your lease gives you a buyout clause where you can get out. Daisy, would, you had a question? I did. Uh, what would be an incentive or the reasons for uh, an owner of a property to have a fixed master lease? So Why would they do a fixed master lease to you? An owner who's adverse to risk is the guy who wants to lease it to you on a fixed basis. They just want to know either how much money they're, they're going to earn each month or how much money they're going to lose each month. I'll give you an example. I rented a house from two school teachers that were moving from Colorado Springs to Las Vegas, uh, Nevada, and they were going to teach school there. They had a house in Colorado Springs, and they felt that uh, their house was their, their, all they needed for their retirement. They thought it was their big nest egg. And um, they really were adverse to risk. They came to see me, and, and when I discovered that, and my questions usually are something like, do you want to take the risk and you get the reward or do you want me to take the risk and I'll get the reward? What's the difference? If they take the risk, we're going to do a performance lease and they're going to pay for all the expenses a la carte. If they want me to take the risk, I'll guarantee the rent and I'll take care of all the expenses up to some stop loss. So they were adverse to risk and they wanted me to take on the risk. And to give you, a, to let you see how adverse to risk they were, they were a family that had one of these Sears warranties on everything possible in the house if something went wrong. 
which are absolutely worthless when things do go wrong. You can't get them out there and you can't get them to do anything. But that's what they had. And, and they were going to have, who sets, the, well, let me ask another question. Who sets the rent uh, in, 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 when you're renting to a tenant? Who sets the rent? The market sets the rent. So with the market setting the rent, they were going to have a negative cash flow on the property. But they just wanted to know how much money they would lose each month and have that be a fixed amount. So I asked them if they wanted to lease it to me for four years at $9.95 or three years at $9.95 and three more at $10.95. They took the second, which means I probably should have offered them a longer time period because I could have gotten a longer time period. There, that's an example of someone who wanted a fixed lease. I leased it from them for three years at $9.95, three more at $10.95. I subleased it for $12.95 on day one. A $300 spread is more than most property managers get on that price point. Okay? Negative income? Their mortgage payment was $1,330 a month. I only rented it for nine ninety five, oh. So my marketing approach was, we'll lose you less than you're losing with a vacant house. <laughs> okay? They were, not me. No, I'm in it for the money. <laughs> I'm not nonprofit. Okay? Yeah. Is there any chance that the owner may go behind your back and talk to your tenant and try to coin something? Well, trust me, since I create the question is, is there any chance that the owner will go behind my back and go to the tenant and try and cut me out of the deal? I've never, ever had that happen. But uh, I will tell you my paperwork's pretty, pretty solid, and if they did, uh, they'd owe me quite a bit. I mean, uh, and let's face it, why won't owners do that? I mean, let's think about that. Why won't owners go around my back and go to my tenant? Owners are scared to death of tenants and toilets. <laughs> they don't want to fix that stuff. Why do you think property management companies exist in the first place? Because people are afraid of management. I'm here to tell you that management is the easy game in the real estate business. You know. How many of you in the room are flippers? A couple. How many, how many of you uh, are wholesalers? Okay, how much money comes in when you're not working? Zero. I mean, think about that. Now, now, if you're lucky, at some day, you'll get old like me. And either you won't want to work or old like Clyde. <laughs> but, <laughs> and, and you either won't want to work or you can't work. And it really doesn't matter. I can be asleep in my bed and the rent comes in. I mean, that's something you need to think about. You need to be able to control the property long term. Management is the key in this business. I, I don't care what people say. I'm allowed, I, I'm not the best buyer of property, but if you can manage the, pro if you can't manage the property, you're just inventorying the property for those of us who can. We end up with it because you burn out, something happens, and we end up grabbing your stuff. Okay? I, I really believe that. I think management's the key. So let's look at a few other little things. Um, oh, yeah, I started to, started to give you another example of, of the way you can uh, make profit. I had an office manager who worked with me for 10 years and retired at age 65. And she essentially did everything I didn't want to do. And what that really meant is she did most of the bookkeeping. You know, I always wanted my wife to take on bookkeeping, but she said the marriage wouldn't work if I was going to do that. <laughs> so, so, you know, I actually thought when this gal retired that I have a great relationship with my wife, and she'd come into the office, and we'd work and play together 24-7. And she said, forget it. And so that, that didn't work. But uh, so I became the bookkeeper. And, and I can do it all fine, but when you have over 100 houses, just doing receivables and payables is a pain in the neck. And I'm very efficient what I do, do. I have very good software, but still, it takes time. And I had this other company come to me, and they wanted to do business with me. And I said, no, I don't like partnerships. I'm not going to do that. And, and so they kept pestering me. And so finally, I, I spent some time, and I created this kind of a Rube Goldberg m machine of how we could do business. And, and the way we did it was I leased, I or my company leased properties from owners. We subleased these properties to this other company that all also had real estate. 
and they subleased to the occupant. They dealt with the tenants, I dealt with the owners. But I was the conductor of the band. They had to use all my paperwork. They had to do it my way or I could jerk their chain and take it back anytime I wanted. So what did I get out of the deal? I had someone else doing all the bookkeeping. Now what did they get out of the deal? They, wanted, they had an underutilized bookkeeper. They wanted to utilize his time better and they wanted a little more income. But what they really wanted was they wanted me looking over their shoulder, fine tuning their business without nickel and diming them to death. And that really met my needs because there is a point in your life where it's, you really want to pass the baton and show other people how to do things too. That it gives you tremendous joy, I think. So, so when I had figured my end plan if I s wanted to sell my business, because I didn't want to do bookkeeping for the rest of my life and I didn't want any more employees. I figured less was more, no employees. And, and so I figured if I sold my business, and I really don't know if these numbers are right, but this is just the way my mind works. I figured I would get uh, one year's income paid over three years. That's what I thought I'd get if I sold my business. And yet by leasing my business to them, I got 30% of what I got before forever with no overhead. And I thought 30% forever with no overhead was better than 33 and a third percent for three years. That's, I master leased my business they were, the, they were the sandwich tenant. I mean, you can do this with anything. Think about that. Okay, so what else do I have on here? Um, and I need to know, okay, timing. Uh, you know, so, so growth. I told you how I got 50% appreciation to remove a 35-year leasehold interest from a property. And, and just so you, you know the law, the IRS says that if you have a leasehold interest of 30 years or longer, you own the property. You can depreciate the property. Isn't that interesting? So how much could I depreciate? How much was that? How many years did you have a leasehold? I had at least for 35 years. 35 years? How much could I depreciate? How, what was it? What was my basis? I had no basis. I had zero basis because I didn't pay anything for it. I'm paying monthly and writing everything off. If someone had made me pay $25,000 for that lease, I would write that off. But I didn't pay a dime for it. I'm just paying monthly and writing 100% off. Um, I just point that out to you. That that's, that's an interesting little quirk that you might want to know. Well, what loan do you need if you're master leasing someone's property? I don't take on any debt. That's the owner's debt, it's not mine. It's their problem. Either the property's free and clear and I'm leasing it from them, or they've got debt on it, but it's not me. And I don't, I don't borrow from commercial lenders. I only would, I mean, I think it makes sense to stay away from banks. You know, people go in banks and give the banks their money at 0.02% yield on their money. You need to find those guys going into the bank and say, boy, can I solve your problem? I'll give you twice what a bank will pay you on your money. <laughs> maybe even triple on a good day. <laughs> maybe triple, maybe triple, maybe triple. If you're really good. <laughs> yeah. Did you say that if you master lease a property for over 30 years, the loss is You own it, you own it, you own it, that's right. So if you pay for it, you can write it off, but I didn't pay anything. I'm just paying as I go and writing off every dollar I put into it. But you can do a 1031 tax deferred exchange on that. Isn't that interesting? On your leasehold interest. You, 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 you own it or you own it in the eyes of the tax? Own it in the eyes of the tax law. So you don't get title, obviously. No, you don't get title, but you have a leasehold interest, but a leasehold interest over 30 years is, means you own the real estate and can do with the real estate the same things an owner can do with it. You can sell your leasehold interest. You can exchange your leasehold interest for a, a, a property. You can do all those types of things. Okay? Okay. Um, you got a question, right? Sure. Have you had a, a tenant, uh, they don't pay the rent? 
I had, yes. Uh, well, no, I didn't, actually. Uh, I, I, you know, I've had one eviction in my career, and it was back in 1981. And it wasn't for non-payment of rent. Uh, I have had people slow on rent, but uh, we're pretty good at collecting rent. We collect all our rents in five minutes a month using ACH. It all, I take it out of their bank accounts. I collect all my rents on the last business day of the month prior to the first. So on the, on the 30th of this month, which happens to be a Monday, because I've already put it into my bank because I'm going to be out here until the 29th, that all my tenants' rents will be in my bank account. I get back to Colorado Springs the next morning. I go online, get my bank statements, balance my bank statements, and I'm done for the month of October. One time in 1981, and that was a urologist out of a high-end house. And it wasn't for non-payment of rent. It was because he was wasting the asset. He, he was, uh, he'd been divorced. He was raising two teenage boys. He was practicing urology and building fourplexes, had a bunch of women around. He had too much money, didn't care about his stuff, so he didn't care about our stuff either. And the night I threw him out in the street, his kids were on the roof ripping shake shingles off the roof and burning them in a bonfire in the driveway. And we swatted flies with a sledgehammer, and, and, and so we got well taken care of. But, but you need people who will take your houses and make it their homes. And he didn't do that because he didn't have enough pride in his stuff or our stuff. Question. Tenant screening. You, you, yeah, I mean, but you like, you like Sharing expectations. When you initially have that conversation, it's like you're, you're bringing them on board to a whole culture, a conversation that you carry with them that I think really is one of the powerful tools. That yeah, you went. Well, you can say that. Well, I think you that. You don't just say, hey, yeah, here's the keys. Exactly right. I think too many landlords say, here's your contract, sign here, press hard, last copy is yours. Read it if you want, move into the house, sit in a chair, don't touch anything, and here's how we're going to beat you up. That's not what we do. What we say is the most important thing we think we do is we hire someone to do a job. And the person we're hiring is you, the tenant. And the primary job description that we want you to do is maintain and improve the house and grounds. That's your job. That's what we're hiring you for. Second job is to pay the rent on time, but if you don't want to do that, don't rent from us. We're too tough. Thirdly, we want you to get along with the neighbors. Fourthly, and this one's kind of fun, I look them in the eye and I say, we want you to stay at least until you die and hopefully, in, and hopefully until your kids die. And, and we chuckle about that, but we advertise that we're looking for long term and what we think we offer people that a lot of people can't offer is we say, gee, you can move in, put in the vegetable garden, hang pictures on the wall, do what it takes to make it, quote, home. We've never had a house foreclosed out from underneath us. One time we had an owner need to move back into a house. Her husband died. She needed to come back from Europe. She needed a place to live. And, and you know, we moved the tenant into another property. But people can move into our houses and stay. Our longest tenant was with us for 24 years and 10 months. Next longest tenant was with us for 18 years. Most tenants are with us for, well, we have plenty over 10 years. We are in the long-term business, and that's where the profit is. You know, your tenants buy your properties for you. Think about that. Now, I'm running out of time because I think we're done at 9. Is that? Okay, well, because I'm only on the... Well, I'm only on the first page. There's four pages. <laughs> well, keep going. Okay, I got to talk faster. So, so think about this for a second. Uh, there, there's some other benefits. Read those benefits. But before we flip to the second page, let me tell you one of the one of the things I like about master leasing. Master leasing gives you the opportunity to test drive the properties. Has anyone ever bought a new car? And they, they let you take it out and drive it around and see what you think. You test drive it. That's really a wonderful thing about master leasing because, you know, I don't know about you, but I have certainly bought properties that looked right, smelled right, and tasted right until I owned them. And they weren't right. Something was wrong. Drainage was wrong. Neighbors was wrong. Gangs were wrong. Something was wrong about it. 
and I had to get rid of the property. Well, not all houses make good rentals. So if you can lease them first, it allows several things. Number one, you do get to test drive it, but number two, it gives you time to build a rapport with the owner. You, you know, the real estate business is a people business. People are not going to do business with you unless they trust you. How do they get to trust you? If you under promise and over perform, you always do more than you say you'll do in dealing with owners when you're master leasing them. When that property is, when it's time for it to be sold, who are they going to contact? Especially if they've moved out of town. I have gotten some of my best transactions from master leasing first and then people wanting me to be the one that ended up with their property. They'll finance it. They'll do all kinds of things because I've gained their trust. I've done a good job for them while I was in control of their house. Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, and, and what I'm really saying there is when you lease the property, that's not your final negotiation. That's your first negotiation. Think of it like a pit bull. The pit bull has to get the first bite out of the property and then it keeps biting some more until it owns the whole thing. And think of it that way. You know, I mean, you, you need an illustration to kind of think what might work. What? What'd you say? Steel slow. What? Steel slow. Steel slow. Well, maybe, maybe. I mean, people will say, well, why don't you lease option up front? And, and you, you can certainly lease option up front. But my history tells me that most people, if they give you a lease option, they think they gave you more than a lease. And in giving you more than a lease, they want to charge you something in for the option. So they want to charge you $5,000 for the option or $10,000 for the option, or else they want to charge you inflated rents because you've got more than just a lease. Whereas if you have a good long enough lease, I think you have a stealth option. What do I mean when I say that? If, if I have a lease for six years with John here and, and John lived in that house, it was his personal residence, and now he's moved to Cincinnati, Ohio with his work. He, he originally didn't want to sell it or couldn't sell it, uh, but he might have thought he was coming back. And, and now he's decided he's not coming back and he's got a big gain in that house. Well, what's the problem? He can sell the house. He can refinance the house. He can do whatever he wants, but it's subject to my lease. And most people who buy a house want rights of possession. They don't have rights of possession with my lease. So what's the key thing that if I have a lease for six years and he has a big gain, can you see a, a situation where maybe he may have to come negotiate with me? Why? Well, what's so important about that time period? Who knows what rule 121 is? of the Internal Revenue Code? I don't, what is it? <laughs> one, one, 121 says that a couple can claim $500,000 worth of gain out of their personal residence if they've lived there two out of five years. An individual can claim $250,000 worth of gain if they've lived in it two out of five years. If I control that period where he has not lived in it two out of five years, he has to come to me before that time period runs out. Isn't that interesting? And most of the people you're dealing with on master leasing are unintentional landlords. Most, most are. You, you still take on landlords, burned out landlords who don't want to deal with uh, tenants and toilets. But most of them, there's, there's good stuff here. People don't understand the value of a, of a lease. Leases are extremely valuable. They've been used in commercial for years and years and years. You know, the biggest example I can think of is Hong Kong was leased from the People's Republic of China for a hundred years. It was subleased to developers, who subleased to builders, who gave 60-year land leases to owners. Big deal. Hawaii, most of Hawaii is on land leases. The, 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 uh, the money goes to the uh, Kamehameha schools. Um, has anyone heard of, uh, what is it, WeWork, I think it is? I mean, you know, big deal. They, they lease commercial space, put desks in it, copy machines, a conference room, and, and they sublease it out as an executive office center. It's been done for years. It just hadn't been done in the house business. You had a question. Have you ever had a situation where you're master leasing from an owner and the owner didn't follow through on their mortgage? Ah, very good. You're master leasing from an owner and they default on their mortgage. 
That's really important. You almost need to start thinking about doing credit reports on owners before master leasing them <laughs> to make sure that credit's important to them and that they have the financial ability and willingness to pay their bills. But here's when you don't. If there's enough equity in the property that if they lose and don't make their payments and your lease allows you to go in and make their payments for them and extend your lease by a large amount for every hundred dollars you advance, you may like that. Or if you have the right, because you have a, a secured position in title recorded because you've secured your lease with a deed of trust, that you, you can go into the sale and bid and if someone wants the property, they have to take you out well, and, and you have a big profit. So if there's enough equity in the house, I kind of like that. <laughs> if there's not, a, I mean, it's a way to acquire property that way. But if there's not much equity and you question their moral code, make sure that you can stop anytime you want if they don't, and you're not liable to your occupant tenant. That's why all your leases have to work together, that if you ever lose your lease position, you're not liable for promising someone else they have rights of possession that you can't give them. Yeah. Kind of a follow-up to that. What's the length of time you sublease to your, your tenants? All of my tenants, my existing tenants, all of them, the ones that were there for 24 years and 10 months and everyone else, they're all on month-to-month -month contracts that terminate one day a year. Now that's a little unusual, but I can't really explain everything to you in the next 20 minutes. Because if, but, if, you have, if you're signing one year lease, that's with right. them, then the situation. I don't do that. You know. I don't, mine are month to month that I can get them out in 21 days. Now in this state, it would take you 60 days. But you know, you need to know that. And if a foreclosure starts, it's going to take more than 60 days before it finalizes. And the, what's really interesting is, now think about this for a second. If you remember, uh, if the foreclosure took place and you had a lease on it, it used to be that tough, you could lose it. Then the government said, oh, no, no, you've got to protect the poor tenant. So it, it's good for the tenant through the balance of the lease. Then that went away. Then it came back in. And so now I'm the master tenant with a long-term lease on a property and it's foreclosed. Huh, I wonder how long my lease is still good for. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Yeah, but I have a valid lease that I'm making payments on. Think about this too, you know, um, uh, 1482, the new law that's, that's just being signed into, uh, you know, just been passed, hadn't been signed by the governor in the state of California, says if you have a lease that you've, or a month to month that you've been in for 12 months or longer, then the owners have to show cause as to why they can get you out. Now, does that mean as a master tenant, if I have a lease that I've had for more than 12 months, I can really have that lease for the rest of my life unless the owner is going to sell the property or move into it? Isn't that very interesting? <laughs> and they can only raise the rent on me, on my lease, if I have a fixed lease, 5% plus the cost of living, no more than 10%. Isn't that interesting? If the law is pro-tenant, become a tenant. Think about this. It's really good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we're not going to get through this, but that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> you want to select tenants who can maybe fix toilets on their own? And yeah, of course. How, how do you select those types of tenants? <laughs> how do you select tenants that can? How do you select tenants that can fix toilets and do things on their own? Well, first of all, on our application, since we deem we're hiring someone to do a job, we ask their skill set: plumbing, roofing, appliance repair, type, others tools you own. We ask those things. You need to know that type of stuff. You know, can you discriminate? And, and well, first of all, how many people in this room ad admit that they, they discriminate? How many people admit? Yeah, admit they discriminate. Admit they discriminate in finding tenants. That's good. That's good. That's good that you say that because you better discriminate. If you don't discriminate, you'll go broke. You just can't discriminate illegally. Don't discriminate against a protected class. Now, a HUD will make you scared to death and think that the word discriminate means you can't do it. You better discriminate based on credit, discriminate based on income, discriminate based on employment, discriminate based on present and past landlords. 
do those kinds of things. And, and if you are hiring someone to do a job, make sure they got the skill set. So if you got two applications side by side and you're in the house business and one person's coming from an apartment and one person's coming from a house, which one would you rather do business with nine times out of 10? Why? They got the yard tools. They got all the stuff. They're used to all that. Okay? So just a point. Question in the back. Got it. I got it. Did everyone hear what he said? Yeah. Okay. So, so l let me ask a couple of questions back just to, to get a little more feedback. When you do a lease option, do you intend for them to exercise the option or is it a way for you to generate more income or option consideration up front? Do you want the property to go away or not? I, I want it to go away. Like, you know. Okay. And, and so do they exercise as a rule or is this a new thing you're doing? I just haven't had it long enough to... Okay, so let me give you some feedback. Let me give you some feedback. I find most people lease option to their tenants for one of two reasons. Either they want to get higher normal, than normal rents or money up front, or they want to, or they want to force them to, to have the property go away. And what I see happening too often is they set it up that they can't buy it at the end. And so all of a sudden, people have paid $5,000 up front. They paid rent over time. All of a sudden, they realize they lost this money, and they get pissed off. And funny things happen to your properties. <laughs> I've heard of concrete being flushed down the john. I've heard of funny things happening. And, and I don't want to do business that way. I do motivate people with a carrot. I have something called a performance bonus that rewards people after they move out based on how they've maintained the property and paid their rent on time while they're there. And we do take care of our tenants. So we do use positive reinforcement more than negative reinforcement. But you know that, that answers that part of your question. Now, something I didn't mention uh, earlier that I'll just mention, I said that I don't normally do a lease option up front because people uh, want to charge me more rent or something for the option. Here's when I would do a lease option up front. I would do a lease option up front when I want to lease a property from Clyde. Clyde won't lease me the property. He won't lease it to me. But he wants to sell me the property. So I'll say, congratulations, Clyde. You just sold your property. I just won't be able to pay you for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. And then I'll do a lease option. So it depends on the situation whether I will or won't. And, but the other thing, I already answered your question. I just want to make sure you heard that question. So 1482, right. Right. So does that provide rights to the tenant that you went out to? Absolutely. Of course. Okay. So who, uh, who are, do you, are they responsible? Is the landlord responsible? Are you responsible? I'm their landlord, and someone else is my landlord. So they, the tenant that you went out to, you're responsible to pay them the month that you need to get them out, or if they just cause eviction? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the owner of the property has no responsibility to my occupant. And so that's why it's absolutely paramount that if I ever in any way can lose my leasehold interest and I promise someone else rights of possession, that's <coughs> a felony. I mean, I have a problem. It's fraud. I, I've promised something that I can't deliver on, and all of a sudden <coughs> I've got a real problem. Yeah. No, the, the question was, what happens in foreclosure if there's lots of equity? If I have a good long-term lease, my 35-year leasehold interest, I, I, I recorded a deed of trust. Now, what's a deed of trust? You're a deed of trust state, aren't you? Or are you a mortgage state? Deed of trust. So what's a deed of trust do? It glues a promise to a property. 
The note is the promise generally, right? Well, there's no note here. So what's it gluing? It's gluing the owner's promises they give me in their lease. And what are their promises? That they will pay the underlying taxes and insurance and, and pay the underlying indebtedness. And if they don't do that, I have a deed of trust recorded and my deed of trust is, gives, is behind, presumably, the loan that's being foreclosed. So if I bid the amount of the loan, I got the property. Now someone else wants the property, they got to get rid of my lien, they got to pay me. And so I put a high value on my deed of trust. So I win or I win. I get the property or I get a lot of money in my hand. Okay? Uh, did I see another hand back? Uh, well, I see a several of them. <laughs> go, go ahead. Um, I have a two-part question. Okay. I've had them all. I've had them all. I mean, I've certainly done the rehabs. I, I, I've done them all. I mean, I'm looking for opportunities. I'm looking for opportunities. And, and the question is distressed properties or, or done fixed up properties. If, if I'm doing a performance lease, I'll make the owner fix it up before we put a tenant in it. If I'm doing a fixed lease, if I have it long enough, I may agree to do some stuff. On my 35-year leasehold interest, I put the yard in. I put the sprinkler system in. I lost money the first few years. I, I painted the inside and put carpet in. But I also, by the end of 10 years, I was generating more than twice the rent that I was paying out in rent. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I got half the appreciation. So trust me, I did okay. So it, it, the answer to every real estate question generally is it depends. You see what the owner needs, give them what they need, take everything else. Now that doesn't mean, you know, it means I'll throw them a life preserver when they're going down, but I'm not gonna jump in the river and drown with them. You know, I'll, I'll offer them what makes sense for me economically and that's as far as I'll go. Okay, and then ideally, with your tenant, is there a certain amount up to that you expect the tenant to pay out of pocket? Yes, $1? yes, yes. Our tenants, we've tried different things, but over the years, our tenants are responsible for the first $75 of anything that goes wrong in a month. And they have a list of our preferred vendors. They call our preferred vendors first. They don't call me. I'm out of the equation. I took my wife and kids around the world one summer, had no problems whatsoever. We had a house that a, a, a neighbor was moving out of a house. It was, and, and their car was, or truck was parked on, moving truck was parked on the hill, didn't set the brake, it ran down the hill, came to a T of another road, went across that road, wiped out part of the wall of my garage of my house. So what did the tenants do? The tenants who spoke Spanish, the husband spoke some English, but the, the, the wife did not. Uh, the fire department comes, the police come, they were all wondering what to do, and I'm in Bali of all places, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't even know about it. So what did they do? They grabbed the lease, and the lease told them who to call. They called the handyman, handyman came out, secured the garage, they got the, uh, the automobile guy's uh, insurance. He paid to fix the whole thing. I came back, it was all done. No problem. Yeah. Question. Yep. Uh, yep. Which might, you know, eat away your, uh, well, think about this for a second. Let's say that I agree to take care of the first $75 of anything that goes wrong in a month. How much do I really have to pay out? Because well, my tenants have agreed to take care of the first $75 of anything that goes wrong in a month. Right, right. But what if it goes over and then it's the owner's responsibility right. per my contract. <laughs> it's whatever I agree in my contract. Remember, I can be Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. When I write my contract to lease the property from the owner, is it going to be pro-landlord pro or pro-tenant? Pro-tenant, because I'm the tenant. Now, when I lease to my occupant below me, is it going to be pro-landlord or pro-tenant? 
That's right. Now, now, now that's another point to bring up. If you buy a piece of real estate and you go to a closing, do you get to create the paperwork? No. Heck no, they, they put papers under you and you gotta sign them. This is really neat in this business. You get to create the paperwork and so you can totally protect yourself. Let's say you have a, a fixed lease. Well, I did, my 35 year lease. The very first uh, escape clause I ever wrote said that uh, after 36 months, with 60 days advance notice, with one month's additional rent payment as a lease cancellation fee, I was out of there. So after three years, I could cancel my lease. And I thought, well, if I could cancel my lease, then the owner ought to be able to cancel their lease. So their contract said that with 36 months left to run on the lease, if the property materially was destroyed, they could cancel their lease. <laughs> so they had three years at the end of the lease, I had three years at the beginning of the lease, I thought that was fair. That's what I wrote, because I get to write the documents. Yeah. 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 Question. Um, have you ever had any issues with or had to contact the owner's lender to uh, make sure that this is allowed? I've heard of situations. To, to make sure they're making the payments? To make sure that the lease is allowed in the contract. No. Never have. Have I ever had to contact a lender to find out the lease is allowed in their contract? Leases are loud. I, I, you know, I just have a lease, a lease. I mean, you know, property management contract only can usually in most states run for a year at a time. And, and the agents need to be licensed. Why? Because yes, their fiduciary responsibilities to the owners that they're managing for. However, their business plan is to maximize their bottom line. So that allows for a potential conflict of interest. In my case, I can do long-term leases. I can do things they can't do. I'm not under bureaucratic control. Totally different realm. Okay. Does this sound at all good? I mean, this is good yeah. stuff. Yeah. Uh, since you're on a fixed lease, I'm assuming landlord can't raise rents on you, but you being the master tenant can raise rents on your tenant. Well, if, if I'm on a fixed lease, it could be, see, you can do a hybrid lease. I, I can do a fixed step lease that goes up over time. I, I, but you're right. If I have a fixed lease at, at one, one price and I sublease it, yeah, I can raise the rents whatever I'm allowed to raise. In your state, it could be once a year uh, with 5% plus the CPI not to exceed 10%. More like to the 8% where you're always just paying a percentage of Yeah, that's a, that's a performance lease. Yeah, you know, any of the above. And you can decide who pays for the advertising, who pays utilities when it's vacant. All these things are negotiable. You see what the needs are, meet the needs. See what's left, take what's left. Draft by design, not by default. Yeah. There's, we have some more stuff here, but go ahead. Do you recall the of trust with the county whenever you have a master lease? Say it once more. Do you recall the deal of trust with the county whenever you have a master lease? Yes. Uh, I, the question is, when do I record and what do I record? On a performance lease, I don't record anything. Why? I figure, you know, I, I go in with a meeting of the mind that if we're going to do business, I want you to agree that we're going to do business for a minimum of three years. Minimum. Why? Because it takes me a time to kick the tires, shake down the house, and get it right. And, but our performance lease is going to be on an annual basis. And my really thoughts are, if, if you don't like doing business with me and I don't like doing business with me, you, we'll just go our own ways. Because, I mean, I want it to be fun. And so I don't record anything on a performance lease. If I have a long-term fixed lease, yes, I record. Now, what can you record? Well, my lease is in recordable format. It gives a legal description of the property. There's a, an acknowledgment uh, by a notary. And so I can record the lease. I typically do not record the lease. I record the deed of trust that glues the owner's promises in the lease, and I record that. Why? I don't want everyone to see my paperwork. But uh, Peter Fortunato, a good friend of mine, he'll record everything because his filing system is so bad, he's worried he'll lose it, and he knows if he records it, he can always go find it. Well, uh, how many people know Peter Fortunato? I mean, if you've been to his house, you'll understand. <laughs> He's a good friend. I was actually in Atlanta last weekend with Pete and, and Bill Cook on their What Box uh, seminar. It was excellent. So, should I cover a little more here? Or, or, okay, good. 
So what are some of the benefits of master leasing? I'll, I'll do this one little section, then I want to talk about management. First of all, you don't need any capital, very little. Less risk than ownership. Uh, can draft by design, not by default. No standard paperwork, that's a plus. Income's passive, can increase over time. All rent paid by master tenants deductible. Works anywhere with better houses than you could afford to purchase, that's a plus. My first house was a crappy little house that, that you know, you don't have to do that. Go for the good stuff. Um, let's see. I lost it. Uh, control property without ownership. Valuable leases can be borrowed against, sublease or sold. No bureaucratic control. No competition. There is none. No one does this stuff. You can test, test drive properties. Low profile. You know, if you own a bunch of properties, you have a bullseye on your back. Someone stubs their toe walking into your house. Some lawyer picks it up on contingency wants to come after you. Here, you're a tenant, you don't show up. Go sue the owner, don't sue me. I, I'm just a tenant. Uh, negative cash flow property can provide you positive cash flow. I gave you an example of that. The people's mortgage was thirteen thirty a month. I leased it for nine ninety five. Comment. Um, that pass through liability you mentioned earlier, where you know the owner is isolated from a certain amount of liability. Whereas, is that written? Is that a clause that's in your lease? It is in my in my. It, it absolutely is on uh, all applications. We have an acknowledgement and, and a disclosure agreement that, first of all, my company either owns or is leasing and subleasing this property. And, and anyone who rents from us agrees that they'll all solely look to our company if, if there's any problem now or in the future regarding it. So one time, someone, when I was dealing with that other company, I leased my company to another company and they did the bookkeeping. Um, some attorney got involved and said, you know, we're going to come after you with hammer and tongue. We really don't care. And, and the company didn't know what to do, so they called me. So I called the attorney and said, uh, well, you know, the, the owner's not part of the deal in this. The, there, was, there was a sublease, and, and he said, well, we had no knowledge of that, so we're going to sue everyone we can possibly sue. I said, give me your fax number. Let me fax you something over. So I faxed him this, this release over, and I said, furthermore, you might want to read paragraph 23 of our contract that says if we ever have to go to court, all of us agree to pay our own way. And I said, he hadn't paid us yet, so maybe you'll be luckier. <laughs> Boom, it went away. It went away. I mean, attorneys, attorneys, they want to get paid. And when they're not going to get paid or the tenant's going to have to pay them, my f most people say that if we go to court, you pay our way. And what the court says is if you do that, then if you lose, you're going to pay their way because it's not fair to do it one-sided. So if instead you say, if we ever go to court, we both agree that we're going to pay our own ways, I figure I have deeper pockets than most of my tenants. And I think that will help you. Okay, what else? Um, leases can be long-term. Increasing interest rates have no negative impact on you. You don't care. Uh, you can have all the benefits owners don't need. Big ticket expenses don't have to be your problem. You can maintain your day job. You know, I met a guy a year ago. Well, he didn't quit his day job. Don't quit your day job to get in the real estate business. Too often people say, I don't have enough time. I got to quit my day job so I can really do this. I think it's much better to pick your big toe in the water, try something one time, see how bad it hurts. You, if you find it doesn't hurt and you like it, do it again and do it again and do it again. But build up your income before you throw away your job and your source of putting food on your table. You don't have to jump in full bore right up front. Go slow. It makes much more sense. You got, mo I mean, I'm looking around and you guys have a lot of time left at you. Some of us don't. <laughs> but uh, uh, earn owners trust leasing their property and they'll send you referrals. They'll, they'll give you, it gives you great negotiating advantages. Is there any downside? You got to know how, first of all, you got to know your state laws. Uh, those of you who don't know um, uh, 1482, you better go read it big changes. It's done. Read it. Make sure you know it. Uh, it, it, it makes, you don't want to be in, in multi-family uh, properties right now because you have to comply with everything. Single families, less than 10. You bypass a lot of stuff. Read that law. Uh, you gotta, you got to screen for the best tenants, and then you got to share expectations. 
you know, these guys who just hand people a, a contract or have them fill out a contract online and never want to see their tenants, how can they expect to get good results? You've got to be able to share expectations. You've got to be able to tell them what you want them to do, or otherwise, how can they possibly know? Draft safe documents can create consistent policies and procedures. If you're buying your very first rental house and you have none right now, you need a policy procedure manual. You need to decide how you, you're going to do things and why you're going to do them that way. So you can show you consistently treat all folks the same. Now, all of that works with the exception of disparate impact. Disparate impact says that, you know, if certain classes of people, you can be doing everything legal and right, but what you're doing can have a disparate impact on a protected cl class. And the example I would give you is if you read the Federal Register, it says, for example, that more uh, black and Hispanic folks have been incarcerated than white folks, for example. So if you have an arbitrary uh, rule that says we will not rent to ex-felons, uh, that is illegal under the current HUD requirements. You've got to be careful on that stuff because not all past felons would make poor tenants. Some of them would be absolutely fine. You got to know what the individual situation is. So in most cases under fair housing, it says be consistent, treat everyone the same. But in these situations, it's you got to look at people on a case by case basis and and see what the situation is. Do you have a question? Yeah, when you are meeting with your prospective tenants, and, uh, do they know that you are master leasing? They know that the question is, do they my prospective tenants know that I'm master leasing the property? we disclose right up front that we either own or are leasing and subleasing the property. So I don't specifically tell them whether we own or whether we're leasing or subleasing. And all of my tenants are, when they're involved with us, are, are all involved in subleases. Why? Because any properties that flow through to my tax returns, I still lease them to my company and they sublease them to the tenants. So they're always dealing with a situation that it's a, a lease and a sublease, okay? Yeah. So, uh, how would you uh, comment? Uh, so, in a situation of a performance lease, how would you com uh, comment the owner to uh, give that to you as to just you know giving it to a property manager? I think one of the big way reasons is if he gives it to a property management company, first of all he's vicariously liable for all of that property management company's faults. Anything they do wrong, he's liable for. Whereas if he leases it to me, he's not. I'm an entrepreneur. He, I give him my phone number. If he calls, I answer on the first ring. If he deals with a property management company, he's got a different person that answers the phone every single time and employees come and go. I think there's a lot of benefits of dealing with an entrepreneur, dealing with a principal in the deal, dealing with someone who really wants to get the properties filled and squared away or don't make any money rather than an employee who goes home at five o'clock and doesn't give a darn. I think there's lots of reasons why they want to do business with me. Yeah. Um, you said that you, for the properties that you do own, you lease it to the company and the company does it. Yeah, I said it that I oversimplified in that I don't own anything. My properties are owned by other entities that are owned by entities that, but okay. yes, but that's right. Okay, okay. okay question. How do you find the owners? I can give you some examples. Um, David Pond in Fort Collins, Colorado. I thought he did something that was very, there's so many different ways to do it. But he got with a title company and he had them give him a printout of owners that had the property tax notices sent to an out of town address for an area that he wanted to farm. Good houses. And he went by and he took a picture of every one of those houses that went to an, the tax notice went to an out-of-town address. Turned that photograph into a postcard, sent it to the owners. So the owners see one side of the postcard or the other. And on the postcard he wrote, I guess you didn't know it was happening. If I can help, give me a call. <laughs> he picked up a ton of properties very quickly. That was one way. Um, the, uh, I'm only gonna give you two because I've got less than 10 minutes left. Uh, Jimmy Napier, I think, he did it to buy houses, but I think his approach was as good as you get. Good as you get. Uh, he, to rent houses, what he would do, 
is he would call on for sale by owners, for sale by owners, and he'd say, I'm calling about your house for rent. They'd say, no, it's not for rent, it's for sale. And he'd say, oh, I thought it was for rent. And they'd say, no, it's for sale. And, and Jimmy is, uh, how many people have heard Jimmy Napier? Yeah, you need to hear Jimmy Napier. I mean, he's not doing seminars, but you can get his tapes from GaryJohnston.com, and it's worth getting. And he has a wonderful book, Invest in Debt, that's one of the, it's, it's classic, you ought to get it. But uh, as only Jimmy would do, he'd say, oh. And he'd hold the phone out here so he wouldn't say another word. And he'd wait 30 seconds or more, and finally he'd hear an owner say, well, we've been trying to sell it, it didn't sell, maybe we'd rent it. Boom, you got one. <laughs> you know, and, and you can cover a lot of territory really quickly like that. How many people know the name Bill Cook? He does door knocking. Has anyone gone door knocking with him? How about going door knocking and, and find, tell people you want to rent a house in this neighborhood? I mean, there's so many ways to do it. There's, there's no, it doesn't mean, you know, the problem nowadays is not only do people want to, you to give them the map to the gold mine, they want you to mine the gold for them and give them the gold. <laughs> there's no, this doesn't mean you don't have to work. You do have to work to do this. But this is a very flexible, good way to generate income for, for people who are starting out that don't have a lot of assets. It really works well. Um, so down the bottom of the page, change your management paradigm to maximize your real estate results. Tenants are your assets, not the real estate. Do you believe that I had a tenant once do a 350 square foot addition on a house for me? that included an Olympic sports-sized master bath with tubs, shower, double sinks, skylight, wood parquet flooring, oak trim, and all the frills. Now, we did pay for the materials, but we didn't pay a dime for the labor. Did the tenant do it for me? No, the tenant did it for them. They, they liked the house. They were there for a number of years. They finally called me up and said, you know, we really like the house, but we have two kids, two different sexes, and they had one bath in the house. So they drew up the plans, got the permits, did the whole thing, and, and we paid for the materials. And because they did it, we didn't have to do it good enough for a rental. We did it good enough in the first place. Tenants do great things for you. In that case, but do you still need permission from the actual owner of the house? Yes. The yes. We, my contract gives me permission to do capital improvements to owners. But yes, with that kind of thing, we would certainly want to get it approved. Now, it's funny, I wonder who the owner was. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, but they are your on-site resident managers. Give tenants the control needed to do the job you've hired them to do. Do ought, you know, when the tenant fails, whose fault is it? It's yours. You hired the wrong guy. You didn't share expectations. Something in your system didn't uh, find out their moral code was wrong. You need to figure out what's wrong. Do an autopsy, figure out how not to have that happen again. Landlording is a lazy man's way to be in this business. Now, good management, you can read the rest of this. Good management is the key to master leasing as it is also to long-term ownership. I really think management's the key. If you read the last page of my deal when you get a chance, and I recommend you do, I think landlords and tenants want much the same things. We both want safe houses. They want to live in a safe place. I want a safe house. I want my wife to feel safe if she ever goes there. They want well-maintained properties. Well-maintained properties bring more rent. It's easier to keep them up over time. If you run a property into the ground and have to resurrect it, it's much more expensive. You can go through the rest. I think I'm out. Okay, I got a question here, but I know I'm out of time. Real quick, how quick do you turn over? Turnover, that's a great, que gr so great question, great question. Uh, I, I want to feed it back to you and ask a couple questions. What day of the month do tenants move out of houses? The first. Or the first. Last day of the month. When do people move into houses? First day of the month. So you're a crackerjack landlord and you can fix up your property between tenants in two days. How much rent have you lost? A month in most cases, because most people want it on the first. So, so if you're turning over your properties every year, how much are you losing? You're losing one twelfth of your rent every year. We, in over 90% of the time, go from a tenant to a tenant with zero downtime. The guys move out on the 31st, the next one moves in the next day. That, How do you do that? Over 
take my seminar and you'll see. <laughs> I mean, I like this business. I, I mean, this is a good business. I've done it since 1978.